Good day. This is Ridwan Boda from ENS. I head up the Technology, Media and Telecommunications Law Practice at ENS. Uh, with me today is my colleague Ira Gunning, who uh, will introduce herself shortly. Uh, today's topic is about artificial intelligence in uh, financial services and specifically uh, from a data privacy perspective. Uh, we'll cover quite a bit of content today, starting off with just some of the scare stories around artificial intelligence. Uh, what practical steps should organizations overcome? And then a deeper dive into what are the data privacy risks in artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence specifically uh, from a data privacy perspective. Uh, I'll ask my colleague Ira to introduce ourselves and enjoy today's session. Thank you so much, Ridwan. I'm Ira Gunning. I'm a director in our banking and finance department at ENS, and I specialize in all sorts of regulatory issues, including financial regulation, but my favorite is data privacy and anti-money laundering. Ridwan, I'm very excited to be speaking to you about artificial intelligence. Um, now, I think a lot of people, I think everybody has heard of artificial intelligence, but we sort of have the picture in our minds that it is the Terminator robot taking over the world. Can you tell us more about AI adoption? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think when one thinks of artificial intelligence, the most popular tool, uh, which is very topical and has been this past year, is ChatGPT. Uh, but artificial intelligence is much broader than uh, just ChatGPT. Uh, when one looks at artificial intelligence and the landscape for artificial intelligence, uh, it's critical that as a starting point, one has an appreciation as to exactly what type of artificial intelligence tool is being used and what are the use cases for artificial intelligence. Uh, there is this real FOMO syndrome uh, which tends to take place uh, amongst all human beings. I think it's very natural. Uh, and with AI adoption, we've seen that being no different. So some companies, simply because artificial intelligence and more specifically ChatGPT has become so topical, uh, seems to seem to want to rush in and simply adopt AI for the sake of it. Uh, the starting point for any discussion on artificial intelligence is understanding the perspective from which AI, AI is being used uh, and what exactly are the business or commercial objectives with AI. In financial services, all the more so. Uh, if one is simply worried about use of uh, a tool like ChatGPT, the rest of artificial intelligence differs materially from uh, other use cases in AI. And I'll just point to uh, some of these in financial services. So where we've seen use cases uh, in, in financial services specifically is around things like fraud detection and prevention, risk management, but also from a customer facing perspective, we've seen things like algorithmic trading, robo advisors come to the fore. We're seeing artificial intelligence being used in personalized banking, in credit scoring, uh, in customer service and support. Uh, we had one client recently in the financial services industry who gave us the example that they act, are actually thinking of replacing uh, almost 80% uh, of their call center staff with chatbots. So this gives a good or a good indication of some of the different use uh, cases with artificial intelligence. Uh, in and, the financial... So, sorry, Redwan, if I can interrupt you there, you know, I also think that it's important for, for our clients to know that if you start using robo-advisors -advisor, or AI for in your call centres, you mustn't forget about the regulation. You might be regulated under the Financial Advisory and Intermediary Services Act. Uh, you may be regulated under the National Credit Act if you extend credit. So even though we don't have any specific regulations in South Africa governing artificial intelligence, our existing legislation um, might might catch you. Uh, sorry, Redwan, I interrupted you. Back to you. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Ira. That's a great point. And I think that just emphasizes uh, the point which I was making was that if your company or your organization is one who's simply using a tool like ChatGPT, your risk differs very materially and increases exponentially when you're starting to embed artificial intelligence technology into the day-to-day -day operations of your uh, of your uh, organization. Uh, so, uh, and some of the risks include uh, those regulatory risks, which we'll uh, expand on in, in, in a great degree of detail. So the starting point for any discussion uh, is to ensure that you are looking at risk 
from a perspective of utility. So why am I using artificial intelligence technologies? And that will help determine those risks. Uh, I think before we even get into how do we tackle those risks and what are those, uh, you know, what are some of the legal and ethical considerations, uh, we need to look at just some of the horror stories around artificial intelligence over this past year. So there's been more than one case uh, before the courts where uh, uh, chat GPT specifically was found to have what's called hallucinated. So it actually generated case law, which turned out to be bogus and fictitious. And the parties in both instances, there was a matter before a court in New York and one before the Johannesburg uh, Regional Magistrates Court. And in both instances, the party, uh, one of the parties counsel utilized ChatGPT without having to vet whether or not the output was correct, uh, submitted certain decisions before the court. Uh, and in both instances, uh, after uh, much back and forth uh, uh, in the legal process, it was found that ChatGPT had actually hallucinated and had found that uh, the case law or the output of the case law was fictitious. And needless to say, that led to not only embarrassment, but also uh, 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 a reprimand from the courts in both instances. Uh, we also and then... If, turned... so, sorry, Redwani, also again, I think it's very important that everybody remembers, and we'll talk about data privacy just now, and we'll talk about um, the Protection of Personal Information Act just now. But when you are using any type of personal information, you have to take reasonable steps to ensure that that personal information is accurate and not misleading and updated. And we mustn't forget about that when we rely on our AI tools. Uh, we can't see... Uh, we, we can't see the results given to us by, by the AI as gospel. We need to go and, and, and verify that it is correct. Absolutely. Human vetting is a critical part of AI technology. And AI technologies are a tool. They're not meant to give you all of the answers, especially ChatGPT, but it gives you a head start. It, it gives you a starting point. Uh, but it does require human oversight. And AI tools do require that uh, human beings still apply their minds to the output of artificial intelligence. Other horror stories which we've seen around AI is AI creating, leading to bias. So there's been one, more than one instance where an AI tool has been found to churn out bias results. Uh, in one specific example, uh, an Asian lady asked the arti an, an artificial intelligence tool to make her look more professional, but what it inadvertently had done was to change her complexion uh, what it gave her blue eyes, it gave her lighter uh, hair tone. Uh, so it basically made her uh, Asian looking features into more Caucasian or European looking features. And that was an unintended consequence of AI usage. Uh, again, the risks from a data privacy perspective and purely from a reputational perspective are quite material. Uh, we also then see the use of deep fakes in artificial intelligence uh, coming to the fore. And deep fakes are more than just photographs of someone or videos of someone. It also extends to voice recordings of, of, of people. Uh, and again, that's where AI has been found to be leading to a lot of trouble. And then the ultimate scenario or the ultimate scare story is the doomsday scenario. So if, for those of you who may have watched the Terminator movies or Resident Evil, it's set in a future world where robots actually surpass humanity and they actually initiate a war with humanity uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, and uh, that is the ultimate scare story. So that's the real Terminator scenario where you've got this, you know, this big uh, robot with red eyes running around like uh, with weaponry, killing people, killing human beings, simply because the AI, AI tools had surpassed humanity and had decided that they uh, would wish to uh, uh, protect the earth from human beings. Uh, and that's Do you think that's optimistic. going to happen, Ridwan? Uh, so, you know, I remember having nightmares about the Terminator. Is, is uh, this uh, what's uh, our future? Th there is a big drive uh, by governments globally to regulate artificial intelligence. Uh, and one of the specific areas which uh, uh, regulation seems to want to ta focus on is on artificial intelligence in the use of weaponry. Uh, and uh, that is a real scare story. Uh, and it is a possible scenario for human humanity, because if you've got AI tools which are now not listening to human beings anymore, that could lead to a number of inadvertent consequences. And that takes me a step uh, further to say, how do we then regulate this? So the author Isaac Asimov in 1940s was credited with this iRobot, so for those of you who may have seen the iRobot movie, uh, he came up with three laws of robotics. Uh, 
I won't go through each of these laws in detail for today's purposes, but essentially these laws were meant to govern the relationship between humanity and robots. Fast forward to many years later, uh, the thinking about eight or nine years ago was that the lawyers should not focus on regulation of artificial intelligence technologies, but rather focus on artificial intelligence gone wrong or the co negative consequences of AI. An existing legal framework should be enough to be able to, to, to uh, protect humanity from AI gone wrong. Uh, fast forward even further to this last year, we've seen with the rise of ChatGPT, a number of governments around the world actually starting to introduce legislation around AI. Just yesterday, the EU passed the AI uh, Act, and I think probably the first of its kind, which uh, where government has actually passed or, or a, a legislative body has actually passed legislation around AI. But the thinking at the moment is that AI must be legislated, it must be governed. And that, that, that then turns us to, you know, there's lots of ethical and legal debates around AI and how to govern it and whether or not it's practical to govern it. For today's purposes, we won't get there. Uh, but what we will focus on next, and I'll turn to you for this era, is the how does artificial intelligence, uh, how, how has it been regulated in South Africa and in Africa, and specifically from a data privacy perspective, what do organizations need to be aware of or concern themselves with over to you, Ira? Yes, absolutely, Redwan. So we have seen some developments in Africa um, on the continent since 2021. We've seen the Africa's AI blueprint being published, speaking of regional AI centers of excellence to encourage collaboration across all fields of um, AI in, in Africa. Uh, it highlights ethical considerations, and I know we don't have time to get into this, but this is so important. And um, human development must always be um, taken into consideration. It does also mention that data has got huge economic value. And I know you always say data is the new oil, and it truly is. And it can be used for economic growth. And it makes suggestions regarding policy and regulatory approaches. We've also seen the passing of Resolution 473 by the African Commission on Human Rights, uh, um, Human and People's Rights. And it, it focuses on the need to address the implications of human rights um, for, for, for artificial intelligence, robotics, and other new emerging technologies in, in Africa. In South Africa, we still, um, AI is largely unregulated. We don't have a specific statute dealing with it. And um, the AI Institute of South Africa was launched by the Department of Communication and Digital Technologies on, on 13 November 2022. And we know that AI regulation is going to come in future, but we must also remember about things like inequality and unemployment and job losses due to AI. Ritwan, do you think that AI is going to lead to, to job losses? Do you think this should be on the radar of our regulators when, when they draft re legislation? I think AI will inevitably lead to job losses. Uh, as to whether that needs to be regulated, uh, 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 that's probably a different debate altogether. So if one turns to the thinking around artificial intelligence and or the connection between human beings and technology in the in the industrial when the industrial revolution came to the fore, uh, there was a big fear that machines are replacing jobs. Fast forward many years later, I remember in the mid 90s attending an accounting lecture and the lecturer is saying that Actually, the converse is true. Investment in technology actually creates jobs, and that has proven to be true. Think about 30 years ago. Did we have uh, an IT industry? Did we have things like website developers, digital marketers, uh, project managers in IT? Uh, so with the advent of technology and the increase in technology uptake, we see new jobs being created. But yes, it does come at uh, uh, at the risk that some sectors will be affected and some jobs will be affected. Call center agents is probably another very good example. Uh, one of the uh, leading global uh, research institutes did a, a study of jobs which uh, may be affected by artificial intelligence. Uh, Ira, you'll be happy to know that uh, lawyers aren't going to be replaced <laughs> yet. <laughs> but I'm quite relieved, I, Yeah, but, but I think that uh, the, the key to the future lawyer success is to work hand in hand with 
technology and with artificial intelligence. That's going to make us better lawyers, faster lawyers, will make us work more efficiently and will upskill our teams much greater. Uh, so yes, jobs will lead, will be replaced through artificial intelligence. Some industries may be impacted more than others, but at the same time, new jobs will be created, new roles will be created, and that means reskilling of our populations and reskilling of our current workforces as well. Uh, when it comes to how do governments tackle this, I think putting a prohibition on AI development and AI usage simply to protect jobs is counterproductive, counterintuitive. Uh, but uh, where the government does have a role to play is to look at what critical skills will be needed in future, focus uh, on those skills development at schools level, at university level, uh, and generally promote artificial intelligence, but in a responsible manner. Uh, as to whether AI should be regulated, my personal view always has been that technology should not be regulated as far as possible, simply because regulation cannot keep up with technology. Technology always seems to surpass uh, regulation. Yes. However, however, in certain instances, uh, I think the existing legal framework is there to protect us already. So when it comes to job losses, we already have the Labor Relations Act. When it comes to the data privacy risk uh, era, as uh, you know, you know better, uh, there's a, a multitude of considerations under laws like POPI, which companies need to take into account uh, when uh, using artificial intelligence. And perhaps you can expand on the, that latter part, because that is a big focus yes. for our Africa days, uh, for our data privacy day. Yes, absolutely, Ridwan. So just to, before I get to data privacy, of course, our existing intellectual property laws, copyright patents should be ta and patents should be taken into consideration, governance issues. But let's um, let's get to the privacy issues. Um, the privacy risks. We are going to see data ownership disputes. We are going to have um, discussions around user consents when it comes to AI, when is a consent valid? Of course, we know consent in terms of uh, the Protection of Personal Information Act, POPI, must be voluntary, specific, and informed, and an expression of will. So the data subject whose personal information is being utilized must know exactly what they are consenting to and what the consequences would be. There will be issues regarding cross-border authorization, where data matching occurs very often we are going to need prior authorization from our information regulator. Direct marketing, a huge topic, as you know, um, direct marketing by electronic means is highly regulated in terms of um, Section 69 of Poppy. But telemarketing is not so regulated. What if it is AI technology being used like a chatbot for our direct marketing? Is that said to be telemarketing or is it electronic direct marketing? I think a good argument can be made out that it is telemarketing and not as regulated as electronic direct marketing. Automated decision making. I like that you said a human being must always over, uh, have an oversight over AI because, of course, the provisions in Poppy that regulate automated decision making only kick in if um, it's automated means solely being used to make decisions regarding um, data subjects. So we, we have human oversight. We don't have those restrictions that we find in Poppy regarding automated decision making. Of course, AI involves algorithms, it involves data, and where that data is personal information, that is where we see our um, data protection laws kicking in. Of course, AI-driven surveillance systems can track individuals. We see AI systems using um, facial recognition, using biometrics. That would be special personal information, and of course, we must know that that is incredibly heavily regulated. So um, I know we're running out of time, but some basics that we have to start off from a data protection perspective is the first question is always, are you dealing with personal information? When is it personal information? It's personal information when the information is linked to an identifiable living human being or an existing juristic person such as a company. When we are dealing with special personal information, such as 
biometrics, facial recognition, then we know that we need to put additional safeguards in place, usually consent, but there are some exceptions. What processing activities are taking place because that, that will inform our risk management approach. Who is the responsible party? Who makes the decision to collect the data in the first place? And are they using agents or operators in this process? Take into consideration whether your lawful basis for processing the personal information is going to be consent or something else like legitimate interests. Of course, consent is not the only lawful basis that we can rely on, but consent is quite useful in that the further processing of the personal information based on consent would not be uh, incompatible with a, a reason for collection. Consent gives us a basis if it is properly drafted to, to do direct marketing. Consent can be a basis for sending information transborder and certainly consent can be a basis for processing special personal information. So, Ridwan, at this point, I'm going to hand over to you for some concluding remarks. Thanks, Hira. Yeah, I think to take a step back, when we're looking at all of the risks around personal information, data privacy is probably one of the single biggest risks that require mitigation. Uh, and one of the questions which we often ask by our clients is, should they be treating AI technology any differently to any other technology when it comes to a risk management perspective from a data privacy perspective? Uh, I recently did a poll amongst a group of uh, uh, leading privacy practitioners, and uh, the initial thinking was that, uh, yes, AI should be treated differently to uh, uh, other types of technologies, but after I, I had a, bit, a debate and a discussion with them, we redid the poll and almost all of them changed their mind to say, actually, AI technology should be treated no differently to any other technology from a data privacy perspective. But I think there are nuances. Uh, part of the nuances is this idea of human oversight. Uh, part of the nuances is ensuring transparency uh, and ensuring that uh, uh, there's compliance with uh, uh, the, the section in Poppy around automated decision making. So there are some additional steps that need to be taken, uh, but as part of a risk management pers uh, uh, perspective, uh, it's critical that a company's data privacy initiatives are aligned with the artificial intelligence uh, 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 in initiatives, uh, simply because the data privacy risks uh, warrant the same sort of level of inquiries, the same sort of uh, assessments, but with the added safeguards of human oversight and ensuring transparency. There are also a number of other risk mitigants which clients would need to put in place uh, when it comes to managing the risk of artificial intelligence. At ENS, we created something called an AI toolkit, and that helps fast track adoption of what we call responsible AI into organizations. Uh, and that looks at risks from a practical perspective. And then we suggest different types of either policies or training or uh, other types of interventions in order to mitigate those risks. From a data privacy perspective, though, it's critical that whoever is leading your AI uh, initiative within your organization has a full appreciation of what the data privacy issues are, uh, liaises and involves the information officer of your organization uh, in uh, any AI initiative, and also ensure that your cybersecurity teams are involved as well. Uh, so, looking forward, I think the world is embracing artificial intelligence technologies. Uh, in South Africa, it's been no different. Uh, most of our clients have done so. Uh, as to what do companies do in the absence of regulation, number one, be aware of the existing regulatory framework, and Ira pointed to some of those because it's much wider than just data privacy. Number two, train your staff as to how to get the most out of artificial intelligence technologies, but also on the do's and don'ts with artificial intelligence. Number three, involve your cybersecurity teams in setting up uh, your artificial intelligence landscape. Uh, number four, put in place policy initiatives uh, when it comes to artificial uh, intelligence and governing and regulating it within your workplace. Uh, and the last point is that when you are looking to procure th uh, AI technologies from third parties, make sure that you've contracted on a sound legal basis for those technologies. So the standard old fashioned master services agreement is not going to work when you are procuring artificial intelligence technologies because the risk to an organization, especially the reputational risk of AI gone wrong is immense. Uh, the risk from a data privacy perspective is also 
absolutely immense and more uh, more focus should be on looking to protect the organization and insulate it against the negative consequence, consequences of AI. Uh, and with that, uh, I wish to thank you for today's session for myself and uh, I'll hand over to Ira to say goodbye as well. Thank you very much from, from me, Ridwan. Yes, and um, thank you, Ridwan. That was incredibly interesting. And thank you so much for listening to us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.